Yes, we are going to continue uh, with the second uh, presentation. That's uh, a presentation of Laura. I don't know if I'm going to pronounce it. Is it in? Should I pronounce it in German or? Uh, in, in German, it will be Kutzler. So I hope that that's correct. And she's uh, Vice President Group Research at Forrester. And she's going to talk about the how to remain the trust of your employees uh, by uh, respecting their privacy expectation and, of course, their privacy. Give a big hand to Laura. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ah, and microphone is working. That's always a good sign. So I'm going to talk a bit about employee privacy. And of course, in much of the much, a lot of the identity data that we, uh, that we use is private data. And so I think talking about specifically how we deal with our employees is actually really interesting. Because we, are all, we all have many different roles in the world. Like you saw uh, Albert's uh, diagram of we go to the gym, we go swimming, we go to work, and so on. And we are sort of consumers in our private lives and citizens in our private lives. And we are employees in our lives at work. And those things are very much not separate anymore. But there are some distinct differences in how we approach our expectations of privacy in the employment world versus in the consumption world, where I go to the gym, or I buy products, or I fly out to Rotterdam Airport, or whatever it is. So very briefly, I'm going to talk a bit about how employees are gaining privacy rights globally. And then what I'm going to talk about is the segmentation that we've developed for thinking about what kinds of employees you're liable to have in your organization and what their expectations are. And you can obviously apply this segmentation to your employee population. Although, uh, if Albert still has only three employees, this is probably not a very complicated segmentation for him to apply. But for those of you who work at larger organizations, this kind of segmentation can help you figure out what kind of population do I have and how do I best meet their expectations so that I reinforce their trust in me as an employer. And I'll talk a little bit about European privacy attitudes of employees in general, the conclusions that we draw from the segmentation and from the attitudes that people have, and then some thoughts on how to approach the members of the five segments that, you'll, that I'll explain in a bit that you have in your employee population. So with that, uh, let's talk a little bit about what's going on globally with employee privacy rights. I'm guessing that most folks here are familiar with the sort of greater degree of consumer and citizen privacy rights that you're starting to see all over the world. We, of course, are quite used to these here in Europe because we've had them for a while. But there are many, many other places where people in their private lives expect and indeed are legally provided with privacy rights. And that's also starting to be true in the employment sphere. So for example, if we start here in Europe with the sort of obvious ones, the fine that our uh, friends at H&M received in 2020 is still the seventh largest GDPR fine assessed to date. And this wasn't for consumer privacy violation, but rather for employee privacy violation. Because H&M required employees who'd gone on sick leave to participate in these return to work meetings, which were then where they had to talk all about you know, what kind of illness they had and how long they were out and disclose all kinds of private data about themselves. And they recorded these things and left them for access for all kinds of people inside of H&M. So that's why they received this rather large fine. So not only do employees here in Europe expect to have these rights, uh, we also incur quite substantial penalties when employees' rights are not protected. In North America, where historically privacy rights have not been so much of a concern, uh, the folks in California, as of this coming January, will have expanded employee privacy rights. And you may say, OK, but that's just one part of America. But if you've ever been to California, you might have noticed it's quite large and has about 40 million people. So, And as California goes, so the rest of the United States tends to go later. So you'll see, I think, expanded privacy rights in for employees throughout the US, although it'll take a while because of the sort of wacky federal system in my lovely home country. And you also see courts in the United States recognizing employee privacy rights as well. And in South America, uh, Brazil's privacy law, with which you might be familiar, which is from several years ago in its first instance, already offers employee privacy protections. And in Asia, uh, believe it or not, China actually has an substantial employee privacy protections. And, and in the sort of new law in India that'll come in, 
I think next year or the year after, you'll see employee privacy rights as well. So not just here in Europe where privacy rights have long been a concern, but all over the world, you're starting to see not just consumer protections, but employee protections as well. And so we've done a lot of thinking about what this means at Forrester, and we've developed what we call the seven layers of trust. And these apply to partners, to employees, and to customers or consumers. And you can see in my lovely fan diagram here, the various levers of trust that are kind of, that are spread along the side. And so those are, we've got accountability, which basically means you as an organization take responsibility for complying with the promises that you make, in this case to your employees, as in what you're going to do, how you're going to use the data, and what kind of protections you're going to provide, so that you're accountable for actually doing those things. That you're consistent, and so that you execute on those promises in a consistent way, so that your employees can expect you as an employer to behave the same way all the time with regard to privacy and other things. Competence, that you actually do a halfway decent job of executing on the promises that you make, so that's important. If you've got terrific promises and you're consistent about them but you don't actually apply them, that's not going to help you very much with your employees or with your customers or anyone else. You've got dependability, as in can I depend on you to do those things in a consistent manner all the time and to inform me about when things change. So these, kinds of, these levers apply to all of those different kinds of actors, whether it's your partners, your employees, or your customers. Empathy, as in do you as an employer understand the concerns and the sort of hesitations that your employees and customers and partners have? And in looking at employees in particular, of these seven layers, empathy tends to be the most important one. As in, you have a certain amount of confidence in your employer because you work there and you've developed a relationship with them over time. And the most important thing for you to see is that your employer understands what you want as an employee and that they try to, and they try to meet you halfway and make sure that they can actually do what you want them to do. And then you've of course got integrity, that you do what you say you're gonna do and rather than sort of promising something and then doing something else. And transparency, that you are transparent and show how you behave and explain the ways that you, in this case, collect data and conduct certain kinds of processes and why you do things that way. So keep these levers of trust in mind as we talk about the rest of what employees expect here in Europe specifically, although we've also got data for, some, for the other regions, and what sort of employees want you to do and how to behave. So in order to develop this segmentation, we asked a whole load of European employees a lot of questions to figure out how they really feel and what they really do. And so one of the questions that we asked them that proved very useful for segmenting the population into different types of employees that want different types of things was this one, which is which of the following reasons would motivate you to share your personal information with your employer beyond what's absolutely required by your contract? Because obviously, if they don't know who you are, they can't pay you. So probably working wouldn't be very effective. So this is about sharing additional data beyond. And so the sort of most interesting answer is the top one, which is 31% of employees said, no, absolutely nothing will motivate me to share more data beyond what's required. And then you've got to improve health and safety in the workplace at 24%. The reason I point that one out is if you've seen data like this from the past couple of years, that number was a bunch higher because of COVID. So employees understood that their employer was trying to protect them and so they needed to share more health and safety related data so that they could develop a safe environment for employees who actually had to work in the office. So you'd expect to see that number declining and indeed it has. And then you've got to keep data secure uh, at 24% also. That one's noteworthy because data, to keep data secure is one of the sort of understood exceptions to certain kinds of employee privacy regulations. And then at the bottom there, you'll see to ensure that I work when I am supposed to be working at a whole 15%. So if, uh, if anyone is thinking that all of these workplace monitoring tools are uh, fine and dandy for all of our employees, there's really only 15% of us that think so. Interestingly, during COVID, this number was slightly higher, 
which I suppose makes a fair amount of sense because more people were working from home. And so employees were like, okay, I understand why my employer might want to keep track of what I'm doing because they don't actually see me every day. And indeed they haven't seen me in months. So this gives you a sense of kind of how people think about these various questions. So how did we put this together into a segmentation? So, and the, we also have a consumer privacy segmentation, by the way, that is similar to, but not exactly the same as this, because the relationship between me as a customer and me as an employee with a given company is different. So you've got willingness to share personal data. You just saw the question about will people share more things than are required and why will they or won't they? You've got data processing awareness, as in like, do I understand what my employer does with the data that they collect? Comfort with privacy policies in the workplace. Do I know what my employer's privacy policy is and how do I feel about it? And protective behaviors, as in, do I, as an employee, know how I can limit my employer's access to data about me? Can I take, do I know how to? Do I know that there are active measures available that I can use to do that? And some employees know and some employees don't. Probably most of the people in this room know, but one of the first things I learned when doing quantitative research is that each of us is not representative of very much. So don't think of yourself as representative of the employee population. So where does this get us to? So this is the privacy segmentation for employees that we've developed. And there's kind of two broad categories. You've got the employees who are willing to share their personal information and the ones that aren't. So that question that I showed at the beginning that says, you know, what would motivate you to share more information than is required is kind of the pivotal, one of the pivotal questions for determining this segmentation. So there are five segments in total, and I'll go through each of them sort of, I'll go through each of them in turn. So you've got your privacy complacent employees. So these are people who are, you know, who don't really take very many steps to protect their privacy. In theory, it matters to them. They trust their employers. They're not really too concerned about their employer sharing their data with other companies. So these folks are sort of somewhat unaware and somewhat comfortable. And here in Europe, that'll be about 35% of your population, I should say. So then you've got your privacy cooperative employees. They are really confident that their employer is doing a good job. Their employer has good privacy policies, good data handling practices, etc. So they are willing to share data because they think their employer is going to do the right thing and is indeed competent to do so. And that's going to be 24% of your population. Then you've got your privacy controller employees. These are your most knowledgeable employees. They understand how data privacy works. They understand how to use tools to limit the amount of information that can be collected. And they examine your privacy policies and take decisions based on those. So they're about 10% of your population generally. And obviously, if you work at a company whose entire job is, is identity or information security, you'll probably have a few more of these people than in the general population. So when you run the segmentation, you'll see differences for sure. And then you've got your privacy confused employees. These are your people who worry about privacy don't really understand how any of this stuff works, don't know how to protect themselves, but say, I don't know about this. I'm not sure I trust my employer to do the right thing. So you're going to have about 18% of these people in your sort of standard European organization. And finally, you've got your privacy cynical employees. These are the people who don't want to share their personal data, think their company's going to do the wrong thing with it, but also aren't real knowledgeable about how to actually protect themselves. So the controllers are the most knowledgeable ones. And these privacy cynical employees, so the general tendency in any given audience full of security and identity people will say, well, like, okay, clearly I go in the cynical category. Probably not, because most of you know what to do to limit data collection. So you're probably in the controller category, I would say. So if you look at this segmentation, the sort of the critical, the critical divide is that willing to share, not willing to share. So your confused and cynical people are not willing to share. They say, nothing would motivate me to do it. Don't even ask me, that's the end. And the folks in the other two segments are willing to share under certain conditions. And those conditions vary depending on which kind of employee they are. So let's dig into kind of who these people are a little bit and look at sort of what they do. So if you ask the em these employees in these various segments, you might think, oh, they're probably going to think their company doesn't do a really good job of protecting consumer data. No. So 
your controller employees, who are the most knowledgeable ones and the ones who take active steps themselves to control their data, 65% of them say, yeah, my employer has good policies, but I am making sure that I stay protected and that my employer actually abides by those policies and doesn't make mistakes. So it's not your cynical employees down there at the bottom are obviously less likely to think that their employer does a good job because they're in general cynical about the commitments of organizations to privacy and about the ability to execute on those commitments. And then if you look at sort of asking them about are they aware of information tracking and processing? Your controllers, who are the most knowledgeable ones, say, yep, no, I know my employer does this. 81% of us know this. And the confused and the confused folks down at the bottom, and interestingly, the cynics, aren't really aware about their company processing this information, which says to you that these people aren't necessarily the most knowledgeable. And sort of a lot of their I do not trust, I am worried about, basically comes from lack of knowledge of what organizations do and how they do it with all the data. And then if you ask them about, are you taking active measures to limit the collection of personal information? Your controller employees, a majority of them are. They know how, they think it's important, and so they do it. And so 64% of them do. Unsurprisingly, it's the confused employees who do this the least, down there at the bottom at 28%, because they don't know how. They're worried about this, but they don't know what to do and they don't necessarily know how to behave. So you, when you look at your employee population, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about what you do with all of these people, because you, you're probably thinking, okay, now I get that I have these different segments in my population, do I do different things with them? And indeed you do, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So, and then you ask them, how comfortable are you with your employer sharing information with other companies? We don't specify the purpose for this here. And so, uh, these are the people who answer, no, I am not comfortable with this, just in case you're wondering why the cynics 99% of them say. So uh, this is a kind of reverse scale question. So unsurprisingly, your cynics say, no, absolutely not, almost all of them. And then a majority of your controller employees say no. But the cooperative and the complacent employees say, yeah, okay, that's all right with me in a majority of cases. And confused employees also, mostly because they don't, I don't think particularly know what we're asking about and what it would mean. Because those are the folks who are the least knowledgeable about how privacy works. And finally, since we talked about workforce analytics, and then I promise no more bar charts after this, or there may, I think there's one more at the end. The, these are the folks who say, I do not want my personal information used for workforce analytics projects without my knowledge. So the reason we've started asking this question over the course of the last couple of years is because these kinds of work, you've all seen the stories in the newspaper and about companies collecting data on how long are employees spending doing various tasks and on the horror stories of people who get bad performance reviews because they got up to get a cup of coffee too many times or went to the restroom too many times or what is this? Uh, so I think you're gonna start to see significant backlash pretty much everywhere against these kinds of tools. And you see that in this information where the majority of employees say, I don't want my data collected for you to do this without me knowing about it. And certainly employees are going to think uh, pretty carefully about what their employer does with that data. And they know that they have rights under here in Europe, certainly under European law, that they can enforce for things that cannot be done with that data because you're not meant to be using them for, for purposes other than what you collect them for, for starters. So what do we conclude about this? There are a few conclusions about European privacy, European employee privacy attitudes. And I should say, one of the sort of things that people always think is that, ah, Europeans are definitely more knowledgeable about privacy and they definitely care more about it than employees and consumers in the rest of the world. That used to be true, but in this, or this year certainly and in the last couple of years in collecting this data, what we see is that the variation of which segments you have the most of in employee populations around the world actually don't vary that much. And European employees aren't actually anymore more knowledgeable than employees in the rest of the world about privacy generally. And you see that in the consumer data also. And I think what that reflects is that with the increasing availability of consumer privacy protections and now employee privacy protections in these other parts of the world, 
all of those people now know what kind of rights should be available to them, and so they are more conscious of it than they would have been several years ago when those rights were only widely available in, here in Europe. So what do we know? We know that some employees, not all, trust their employers more than other companies with their data. So you've uh, sort of, we've talked a little bit about people in their private lives as consumers versus people in their employment lives. The folks in the I am willing to share data segments are, will, you, what you see is that consumers who are willing to share in their private lives are also willing to share in their employment lives. And they are more friendly towards their employers in terms of sharing data than the average company. But you still see, and you see similarly, that the people who don't like sharing data in their private lives also don't like sharing it in their employment lives. And this one is probably fairly obvious, but it bears repeating, is that all employees value clear communication. What they most want is to know, what are you going to do with the data that you have about me? How are you going to use it? And do I get, and I should get to consent to new uses of it that you didn't inform me about when you collected it, just like what you get in the consumer world under European legislation. And employees want to be asked for their data when it's appropriate. Like, if you want to know something about me, I expect you to ask me and to tell me what you're going to do with it, which probably also seems kind of reasonably obvious, but is worth thinking about in your employment lives. Because employers can take the view of, look, I'm the employer. I pay you to do a job. I'm going to do what I need to do to conduct my business. But expectations are such that they want to know what you're going to do and for you to be asking them for it. So I'll just throw the segmentation up on the screen again for two seconds because we're going to talk about what to do with each of the employees in each of these five segments. And so you've got your complacent people, your cooperative people, your controllers who understand what to do the best, and then your confused and your cynical people. So here's how to approach each of these five segments. So the complacent employees, it may be tempting to say, ah, if I have a large base of complacent employees, that's terrific. Then I can do whatever I want. But these folks will only remain complacent if nothing bad happens. So it would behoove you to do a sort of some up-leveling of their risk awareness, probably not using the training that you currently use. You probably need something else so that they become more aware of what the risks are and they understand what behaviors they can use to protect themselves so that you don't have an adverse event and then they lose trust in you as an employer because they feel like it's your fault. And then they end up in one of these, in one of the sort of cynical, seg in the cynical segment and aren't very happy. Your cooperative employees are wonderful to have because they want to share data with you, but their expectations are for respect transparency, and fairness. So if you have a large proportion of cooperators, you want to maintain that because you've got a lot to lose if they end up in a different segment because these folks will generally share with you what you want and let you do what you need to do with the information provided you comply with their expectations. Now, you may be thinking all of the people in this room who probably fall into the controller category, from an employer's perspective, we may not be the most useful employees for them to have because we have high expectations and we know what we're doing. But if you are an employer with a competent program for data protection, having a large population of, of controllers is actually wonderful because they know how to behave, they know how to participate in a data management program, and they know what to do when they want to protect themselves in their private lives so that you don't have incidents that cross over from their private lives into their employment lives. So large populations of controllers, remember there's only 10% of these in your average organization here in Europe, would actually be a real asset for most employers. Confused employees are, are not great, are, it's not great if you have a large population of confused people because they are very likely to stumble into something bad happening to them and then blame their employer for it. So you want to educate them on how things work, how they can protect their privacy so that they feel more comfortable. And if they become controllers and start to learn to use tools to protect themselves, that's actually a good thing. Your cynical employee population is the most difficult to deal with because they are very skeptical and don't necessarily have the capacity to execute on their own preferences. And so they will tend to be very untrusting of you as an employer collecting their data. If you can give them more knowledge and show them how they can be in control, 
then you can turn them into controllers instead of cynics, which would actually be far better in terms of having an employee population that's easier to work with and that's easier to support in the protection of their private data. So, it, so when you look at your employee population and you look at which segments you have, this is what to do with each of them. You'll need to address them slightly differently. And finally, here's what the consequences are if you don't actually do this. So if you learn, if, so what we asked the, fo the folks in all these segments here in Europe was, if you learned that your employer collected your personal information without your knowledge or consent, what would you do? And you'll see the kind of lose trust in my employer there at almost 30% is probably not something that you want. There's not very many people to whom this wouldn't matter. And so you're liable to get complaints. You're liable to have an upset employee base people who become different in how they behave as employees. So it's very worth it to think about not only how do I comply with the law, which of course we all have to, but how do I comply with the expectations that my employees have and how do I help them by meeting them where they are. So thank you very much for listening to all of this. I'm going to not take questions now so that we actually stay on time, but I will be here at the break. If you want to learn more about the segmentation, or learn more about the global data and how you can use it, come talk to me, and I'll be very happy to show you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh